hi everyone welcome back to my channel i hope you guys are all doing super super well so welcome to today's video today we're going to be talking about what happened to 25 year old julio ramirez julio's cousin actually reached out to me and told me about what happened to her cousin and honestly it's just truly heartbreaking it's crazy how i had never heard about this i haven't seen it trending on twitter i haven't seen people talking about it on facebook like it is just so insane how there isn't much coverage on what happened to julio so hopefully by making this video we can continue to spread awareness so please try to be as respectful as you can in the comment section you guys are always super nice and super sweet either way but you know there's always those people that comment something rude i just feel like that's not helpful because julio's family and friends will be watching this video so let's just try to be as respectful and supportive as possible if you guys are new here welcome bienvenidos i hope you guys are able to hit the subscribe button down below so you guys can join the familia also if there's any other cases you guys would like me to cover i do have a case suggestion form that will be linked down below i have a general case request form and a form if you are a friend or family of the victim so both of those forms will be linked down below thank you guys so much for being here and listening to julio's story i truly appreciate it all right you guys enough chit chatter let's jump right into today's video So Julio Cesar Ramirez was born on August 16th, 1996. His parents, Ana and Julio Sr. are from El Salvador and he has an older brother named Carlos and a half older sister named Erica. Julio's family and friends describe him as being a wonderful young man. He was very smart, hardworking, filled with joy, caring. I mean, just an overall amazing person. Hi y'all, my name is Denise. That's me. And this is my cousin Julio, and this is also us. That's, oh, sorry for the glare, sorry. That's Julio, that's me, and if you know, you know. Um, and that's pretty much what I think about when I think of Julio. Um, I think of us when we were younger, like, it just replays in my mind, and, like, all I can think about was when we went to Trick or together, when we would go on vacation together, when we went to El Salvador, um, all the summers that we spent together, literally, like, being two fishes in the pool, like, we were always in the pool, um, whenever we would, whenever I would sleep over his dad my tío julio he would always wake us up with some bacon egg and cheese or sausage egg and cheese and and we would just like after that like it was just, just straight to the pool and when i also think about julio like the first thing that rent comes into my mind like if you knew julio like you knew like his his room was spongebob like everything was decked out in spongebob like talking about the, the the bed the the bed sheets his curtains um there was like a like a wallpaper sticker like to go around like a border that was spongebob theme like there was everything spongebob theme in his room he was also very proud of his culture and would often take family vacations to El Salvador. If you take a look at his Instagram page, you can just see how happy and full of life Julio was. He has so many photos with his family, his friends, smiling, having a good time, and you know, just living his best life. He enjoyed going out with his friends to have some drinks, eat some yummy food, and he was a pretty social butterfly. He made friends very easily, but at the same time, he was very safe and responsible when going out. His parents say that ever since Julio was a little child, he was always very polite and he was always very responsible when it came to his studies. Julio received two bachelor's degrees in psychology, speech, and hearing sciences at the University of Buffalo. He also obtained two master's degrees, so he was a very smart man. In 2021, at the age of 25, Julio decided to move to Bushwick in Brooklyn, New York, where he was a social worker. He eventually got a job working as a bilingual mental health therapist where he would provide counseling for underserved communities, helping people of all ages. He was very passionate about this and motivated to help help those in his community. 
On Wednesday, April 20th, 2022, Julio decided to go out with a friend to the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood in New York. Now, Hell's Kitchen is a very popular neighborhood in New York City filled with bars and restaurants. Lots of young people go out there to meet up with their friends, have some drinks, grab a bite to eat, and I've seen people state that even at 4 a.m., you can still hear people out and about in Hell's Kitchen having fun. So this outing wasn't unusual for Julio. He often went to Hell's Kitchen to bar hop, meet up with friends, and he usually went out on Wednesdays and Thursdays. So that night at around 7 p.m., Julio meets up with his friend Carlos and they begin their night out in the town. Their first stop of the night was at the Rise Bar and then they headed over to Mickey Spillane's restaurant to have some drinks. Their last stop of the night was at the Ritz Bar and Lounge, which was within a half a mile from the two bars they had gone to. When they get to the Ritz, Julio takes this selfie making a peace sign and smiling at around 2.26 a.m. Then, somewhere along the night, Julio and Carlos accidentally got separated. At around 2.53 a.m., Julio sends Carlos a text message asking him where he's at. Carlos replies back saying he's inside the Ritz, but Julio states that he's actually outside and he asks Carlos to come out. Now, I'm not really sure what happened after Julio sent this message. Maybe Carlos wasn't looking at his phone anymore. Maybe he was distracted. Maybe he couldn't find Julio. I'm not really sure why they didn't meet up outside. It wasn't until almost an hour later at 3.45 a.m., when Carlos sends Julio a text message letting him know that he made it home. He asks Julio where he's at and tells him to come to his apartment, but he never receives a response back. Later that morning on Thursday, April 21st at around noon, Carlos sends a follow-up message to Julio asking him what happened the night before. He thought that they had gone back to his apartment together and was expecting to see Julio sleeping on the couch. A notification pops up letting Carlos know that Julio has read his message, but he never replied back. So he thought it was strange that Julio wasn't replying, so he decided to reread their conversation to see if he missed anything. That's when he realized that at 3.46 in the morning, Julio had stopped sharing his location with Carlos. Now, Carlos wasn't the only friend that Julio had stopped responding to. He had also been texting one of his good friends named Shiva the night before, but suddenly had stopped replying. He was also sharing his location with her, so she became concerned when she realized he stopped sharing his location. She continued to send him text messages throughout the day just to check in on him, but she never got a response back. Then she became really concerned when she realized that the text messages were going from blue to green, which usually indicates that the messages aren't going through. Maybe his phone was off. Maybe his battery died. I mean, it was just really weird. Now, a lot of Julio's friends say that he was always on his phone. He always made sure his phone had battery. He always made sure he had a charger. And if he wasn't able to get access to a charger, he would go go on his iPad and continue to message people through there. So if Julio's phone had actually died or if it had broken or something like that, he would have already grabbed his iPad and began texting his friends back. And since he hadn't done that, everyone was really concerned. That entire day on Thursday, April 21st, no one had seen or heard from Julio. It wasn't until Julio's friends and his family began looking for him by calling hospitals, you know, just trying to see if maybe he had gotten in an accident, maybe something had happened to his phone, and that's why he wasn't replying to them. This is when Julio's parents received a phone call from a hospital informing them that their son was dead. Like imagine thinking that maybe he got into an accident or maybe his phone died and then you just get a call from a hospital letting you know that your son is dead. It's just absolutely heartbreaking and it's even worse because the hospital told the family that Julio had been pronounced dead since 4 49 a.m on Thursday April 21st. He had already been in the hospital for some time but the reason they couldn't notify the family sooner is because Julio had been found without his phone, without his wallet, and without his ID. So for a while, they had him named as just a John Doe and were trying to figure out who he was. The hospital also told Julio's family that they believe his cause of death was an overdose. Now, of course, Julio's family was just completely shocked. They couldn't believe that this had actually happened to him, and they were also just very confused. Julio didn't do drugs. Like, his friends have come forward and said that he didn't do that. Yes, he would drink, and yes, he would go out and have fun, but he always took care of himself and was very responsible. The fact that he overdosed and he was found without his phone, wallet, ID, I mean, it all just made the family feel very weird. When I heard that it was a drug overdose, 
my instant thought was that somebody had drugged him. My initial instinct is that he was given something. They just had so many questions about the night Julio passed away and they did speak to the NYPD and this is what they believe happened. So as I mentioned earlier, on Wednesday when Julio went out with his friend Carlos, they got separated at the Ritz Bar and Lounge. They were messaging each other back and forth trying to regroup but ultimately Julio was left outside alone. Now there is surveillance footage that shows Julio standing outside the Ritz bar alone for approximately 12 minutes before walking away. However, when he was walking away from the bar, he was no longer alone. Now he was walking alongside three men. The four of them call over a taxi and at 3.17 in the morning, they all get inside the cab. Then an hour after this cab picks them up, the cab driver approaches an NYPD officer and lets them know that one of his passengers is unresponsive. The NYPD officer looks inside the cab and he sees Julio in the back seat alone. The officer and EMS tried to save his life, but unfortunately, Julio was pronounced dead at a nearby hospital at 4.49 a.m. on Thursday, April 21st. Now, when Julio's friends and family hear this timeline, they're just completely confused. Julio was very safe and responsible, so there's no way he would have willingly got inside this cab with three unknown men. Also, where was his phone and his wallet? None of this made sense to anybody, and they just want to know who these three men are. Now, the family and friends have not seen the surveillance footage, but they're hoping that the police can show it to them so maybe they can see who these three men are. Maybe they can release the images to the public so they can help identify the men. Julio's father says, we want to see if anyone knows this person. Has anyone seen them? So they can contact the police or relatives to give information. What did those people do? Who are these people? I mean, they just want to identify these men and speak to them about what happened that night. The family doesn't believe that this was an accident and they believe that Julio may have been targeted. The reason they believe this is because three days after Julio's death, the family went to his apartment to pick up some of his belongings. At the apartment, his older brother Carlos was able to get access to Julio's laptop. Now they were really close. Carlos knew his brother like the back of his hand and he was able to guess Julio's password. Now when he logged on, he realized that the Apple iCloud password had been changed after Julio was already dead. So who changed that? Then he decided to check Julio's email and that's when he noticed there was a string of weird money transfers coming out of Julio's account. So he decided to log into Julio's bank account and that's when he realized that all the money that Julio had had been completely drained. Every single last cent had been spent between the day Julio died and the moment that Carlos was checking the account. Julio had over $20,000 saved up and now all that money was gone. A couple of days after Julio's death, his brother Carlos went into his laptop to try to find some answers and he discovered that um, thousands of dollars were transferred out of Julio's account after his death. Um, and you know that was very suspicious. He brought that to the detective and from what I understand, they're working on that. Whoever drained his account had spent that money on purchases through apps like Apple Pay and Zelle. They had purchased designer shoes, had gone to the spa, paid for fancy dinners, and they even bought kids Jordan shoes. I mean, what? That is literally insane. $20,000 just gone. So after learning all of this, the family now started to believe that Julio may have been targeted and robbed. El día que él murió, no esperaron nada. E ese mismo día empezaron a, a, a robarle. Más o menos 20 mil dólares. Wow, que mi hermano lo mataron por la ambición al dinero, al maldito dinero. Somebody drugged him to take his phone to rob him. And I mean, that is what happened. You know, like, it's, there's not a doubt in my mind, that's what happened. Literally, my brother was killed, like, over greed. Maybe these three men saw Julio standing outside alone. Maybe they somehow drugged him, got him to go inside of the cab, then robbed him. They asked for his phone, his wallet, his bank account info, and then just left him there. Maybe their intention wasn't to kill Julio, but they definitely intended to rob him. I mean, how did four people enter this cab alive and one of them end up dead? So to this day, on June 24th, 2022, the police have still not identified the three men. They have identified the taxi cab driver, they've spoken to him, but they haven't really released much information about that. 
which a lot of people are frustrated about. They feel like the cab driver could provide a lot of helpful information. I mean, he was literally there the entire time. Like, did he see the three men threaten Julio? Did he see them ask for his bank account? Did he see them drug him? He could have been a witness to everything. So maybe that's why they're keeping everything, you know, hush hush for now, because he does have a lot of vital information. A lot of people also think that maybe the cab driver was in on it. But again, we don't really know what's actually going on. He says that the three men all got off at a different stop so hopefully he remembers where he dropped them off so that police can go there follow up and maybe find these men now there are some law enforcement sources that say that julio's death could be linked to a robbery ring in new york one of the sources said it appears to be a pattern that a group is going around robbing people in the hell's kitchen neighborhood who have been drinking he says that one of the members of the ring usually poses as a cab driver they somehow get the victims to go inside of the cab and then they coerce them to give up their bank account information, give up their phone, and give up their wallets. So pretty much exactly what happened to Julio. However, this is the first case of those robberies where someone actually died. Most of the time they just robbed the person and they end up living, but this time things went differently. The family believes maybe Julio was given a rape drug and an overdose of this can lead to a coma, respiratory arrest, and even death. Now, originally Julio's death was listed as a possible overdose, but the medical examiner has stated that Julio's official cause of death is still pending further study, which could take a couple of months to be completed. Police say they are still investigating the case, but at this moment, there are no leads as to who the three men are. They also haven't been able to track down who drained Julio's bank account. Like, you would think it'd be easy to just see who bought those Jordan shoes, you know, who went to those fancy dinners, who used the Apple Pay. So hopefully, Hopefully police keep this case open and hopefully find the men that robbed and if so drugged Julio. So Julio was buried at Pine Lawn Cemetery on Sunday, April 30th. One of his best friends, Karenina, said, He's been buried, the wake is done, the funeral is done, now we're just left with questions. We don't know what to do. Imagine finding out that your loved one was potentially targeted, drugged, and then robbed, and there's no answers as to who did this, how did this happen, and you know, there's just no closure. We want to find justice. We want to find out who did this. It's been taking a toll on all of us. You know, everyone knew how lively he is. We can we can all hear his voice. Maybe he was drugged or he was slipped something. For him to get in a cab with, you know, strangers. Again, he's a friendly guy, but, you know, he's typically very safe. If this is something that's happening, if it's common in Hell's Kitchen, then people need to know about it. Julio's friends and family are trying to draw more attention to his story in an effort to force police and the medical examiner's office to take a closer look at his death. His friend Karenina has an Instagram page where she posts updates about Julio's case, how you can help, rallies you can attend, and so much more, so I will link it down below if you guys want to check it out and show her some support. So on Wednesday, June 8th, family and friends and members of the community gathered to hold a candlelight vigil and moment of silence in memory of Julio. A lot of people there were holding up signs saying justice for Julio and they marched in the street towards Times Square. Participants at the vigil said that they hope they can raise awareness of Julio's mysterious death and just push the investigators for more answers. Now, this vigil was organized by Katie Savage, who lives in the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood and is frustrated with the lack of information regarding Julio's death. She said, There are still people out there who did this, and who knows if they've done this to someone else. Until they're brought to justice, this can easily happen again. Another participant in the rally said, There are probably people here who are victims of a similar case like this. The more awareness we can raise on how we can protect ourselves and keep our friends and community safe, the better. The turnout was, it was incredible. The amount of support, you know, it really showed me and showed his family that he was cared for, you know, that his story touched a lot of people. And I think a lot of people there realized that they could have been Julio. Now, a lot of people fear that maybe Julio was targeted because he was gay. 
Pride Month is here and there's a lot of people coming from out of state to go to Hell's Kitchen and celebrate. And you know, members of the community just want people to be aware and stay as safe as possible. They want people to go out and celebrate Pride, but also know that they need to be safe and make sure that their friends are also safe. Now, we don't know for sure if Julio was actually targeted because he was gay, but the bars he was at that night were all gay venues. The owner of the Ritz bar, Tommy, spoke at a press conference about Julio's death. He said, I've been the owner of the Ritz for 17 years and an operator of an LGBT establishment in Hell's Kitchen for 20 years. I've had my share of prides and my only advice is to be aware of your surroundings. Be aware of who's with you and who's coming and going. He says that now he's going to make sure that everyone's bag is checked before entering the bar and he's going to go around to make sure that everyone is safe, everyone is feeling comfortable, and everyone is just having a good time celebrating pride. He just doesn't want this to happen to anyone else. Like I said, Julio's family and friends say that he did not do drugs and that this wasn't just some random attack. They believe someone targeted Julio, drugged him, and then robbed him. They say that for him to get into a cab with a bunch of strangers that he doesn't know and willingly just give up his phone, his wallet, and his belongings just doesn't seem like him. The family just has so many questions. Who are the men that got into the taxi with Julio? Where is his phone and wallet? Who drained his bank accounts? At what stop did the three men get off? What does the taxi man remember about the three men? There's just so many unanswered questions, so I really hope that the NYPD continues to investigate this and helps the family get the answers that they need. Whoever robbed Julio and potentially drugged him needs to be held accountable. If this is some robbery ring that's going around in New York, please just be careful if you're in that area. Please stay safe, stay with your friends, don't leave your friends alone, and don't leave by yourself. Julio's family and friends say that he would want people to learn from his story. He would want people to be more aware of their surroundings and to know that not everyone has the best intentions in this life. So what we can do right now to help Julio's family and friends is to continue to share his story. You guys can use the hashtag justice for Julio to share his photos, share his story, and just keep the momentum going in his case. The family just wants to keep the pressure in hopes of a thorough and conclusive investigation. His friends did start a GoFundMe campaign to help raise money for a commemorative bench for Julio. If you guys know anything about this case, please call the NYPD's Crime Stopper Hotline at 1-800-577-TIPS or if you want to call the Spanish Hotline, please call 1-888-57-PISTA. And please, no victim blaming in the comment section. It's just not helpful. We don't know if Julio willingly got in inside that cab with those three men. We don't know what they told him to get inside. We don't really know what happened, so please, let's not blame the victim. He didn't deserve to be drugged. He didn't deserve to be robbed. He didn't deserve to have all his money drained from his account, and he didn't deserve to die. Le quitaron la vida a un muchachito, un niño que empezaba su vida un Julio was a bright young man with a full life ahead of him and he didn't deserve this. Thank you to Julio's cousin and his friend Karenina for trusting in me to share Julio's story. We will continue to support you guys and share Julio's story until justice is served. All right, you guys, that's pretty much all the information I have for today's video. Again, if you guys have any information about what happened to Julio, please contact the NYPD. I will leave all of their information linked down below. I'll also leave the GoFundMe and Karenina's Instagram page where you guys can see updates about Julio's case, more information about rallies, and, you know, just stay up to date. My thoughts and prayers go out to Julio's family, and I truly hope you all get closure and justice soon. Thank you so much for watching today's video. I truly appreciate it, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye, guys!